When we last spoke about the changes in Beyonce's voice, we pointed out that if Beyonce's voice was really changing, then she would adapt to those changes in the songwriting of any new music she did. And here we have it, a seventh completely original album that Beyonce has now completed a world tour with, Renaissance. With this new album, we have new data. And with this data, we can not only hear how Beyonce has settled into the changes in her voice, but we can also hear the new environment that she has created for her voice on record and on tour through the power of songwriting. Beyonce's voice is changing and it's changing her music. If we're using Beyonce's most recent pregnancy and childbirth as the onset of most of the change in her voice, then on The Gift and Homecoming, the changes in her voice were relatively new. Now, Beyonce had roughly four years after the birth of her twins to get used to her voice again before Renaissance. She had to find its new strengths, maneuver its challenges, and create a new world of sound that takes what she already does well and lifts it. And Renaissance is nothing short of that. On it, we hear Beyonce bringing us back to the dance floor, whether it be the house of Break My Soul, you won't break my soul. the ballroom of Pure Honey, Meet in the middle, dance all night. or the funk of Cuff It. Now from track one, I'm That Girl, we are hearing Beyonce sit in the new weight her voice has and the shift in its range. When she sings It's Just That on the track, we hear a beautiful C3 that is absolutely solid. And she does it again in the background. You could move a mountain with this lower register. And just to compare, that C3 is even more heavy than the same note six years prior on Hold Up off of Lemonade. And the thickness continues when we hear the D3 at the very end of Virgo's groove. Her voice is sitting. And it's not just her lower register. It's her voice overall. Let's listen to a singing tone that Beyonce has used often throughout the years and hear this evolution in real time. Now there's a distant heady tone that Beyonce pulls out in the verses of Naughty Girl and Baby Boy. We're going to pull from when she uses this tone around the same area of the keyboard. Let's say F4. So it's the same area, but different songs through different eras. Now for the first clip, we'll pull from a deep cut off of Dangerously In Love, Beyonce's first solo album. The song is called Signs. He was freaking like a Taurus. Next, we have Resentment from B-Day. She sings a little bit higher than the F, but still hits it. Then I'll be all right. Now Disappear from I Am Sasha Fierce. Now, this background vocal from I Miss You on 4 is hard to hear, but it's in a similar range. Now, No Angel from her self-titled album After the Birth of Blue. Tell me I'm a problem. The tone is getting thicker. Love Drop from Lemonade is slightly lower than the F, but still in the same area. Other Side from The Gift is where we were really starting to notice a big difference. If we wake up. And then from Renaissance, the chorus of Alien Superstar. You can hear over these 20 years that there is a thickness that Beyonce's voice has gained that's made her vocal presence all the more powerful through every part of her range. Then I'll be all right. So you could believe when it came time to belt on Renaissance, Beyonce blew us away. Like on Summer Renaissance, which features the album's highest belted note in E-flat 5. This is enharmonically the same note as the D-sharp 5 on Break My Soul. Now let's compare that to the E-flat 5 on Be With You. On Get Me Body. The D-sharp 5 on If I Were a Boy. E flat 5 on Love on Top, the D sharp 5 on Pretty Hurts, the lighter D sharp 5 on All Night, the E flat 5 on Water, and then our two clips from Renaissance. Beyonce's voice has gotten weightier and bigger on this note, even though she's lightened her technique and how she approaches it. But unlike prior years, belting is no longer the leader when it comes to Beyonce's upbeat singing. 
You see, after Dreamgirls, Beyonce's music led her upbeat singing with a general range that was higher and much more belted, especially in the singles, which is where people heard her the most. B-Day, I Am Sasha Fierce, and Four all took advantage of the more powerful nature of her belts. The singles from these albums show a higher tessitura or general range in their choruses, the part that we'd hear and remember the most. Now to be fair, these were her bigger hits and so this is more indicative of how the public wanted to hear Beyonce high and hard. But as we settled into her self-titled album and Lemonade, we got Beyonce returning to the lower tessituras you originally heard on Dangerously in Love. What a turn and by the time we got to renaissance the range of beyonce's choruses was planted in her lower chest register where they're strong or soft so in songwriting, Beyonce has adjusted to the changes in her voice by moving what she sings to lower tessituras, even though she's known as a belter, which is a pretty brave move if you ask me. And this bravery is something you see if you've watched her videos documenting her process for heading into self-titled. She was achieving a level of independence and risk, and this independence also meant that she was saying what she wanted, how she wanted. More than the music, I'm proud of myself as a woman. Yes. for taking off the risk. The biggest message is owning your imperfections and all the things that make you interesting because I refuse to allow someone to put me in anybody's box. Beyonce choosing to very literally follow her voice rather than the public's expectation of her voice was an act of conscious social defiance, but more than that, an act of self-love. And when you love yourself, you get the opportunity to see the beauty of what's there and make the most of it. And Beyonce embracing the changes in her voice created opportunities for her to find a new secret weapon, something that had long been there, but was now ready to be brought to the front, her head voice. Now the awareness it takes to make these choices that showcase your voice's strengths doesn't just come through raw talent. It's something that's been built through personal study and discovery. And if you're looking to jumpstart that journey for yourself and your singing, I've created a free resource to help you to do that. So check out my free masterclass at reclaimyourvoice.ca slash masterclass. There you'll get five major keys to reconnect with your singing passion and begin breaking your bad singing habits. So head to reclaimyourvoice.ca slash masterclass and let's reclaim your voice. Now, back to Beyonce. Now, head voice is interesting when it's talked about in popular music, simply because it's not used as readily or to the fullness of its capacity as it is, say, in classical music, all because we're usually busy belting. <laughs> and in Beyonce's earlier career, the extent of her head voice use was largely an extension of climactic expression. For example, the E6 on Destiny's Child's Happy Face to the C6 of Be With You, Sometimes there would be gentler, sleeker users of it, like the G5 on Deja Vu. But still, Beyonce's head voice played the role of a roof on top of the more modal singing Beyonce was doing. But on Renaissance, Beyonce used her head voice extensively. And it wasn't just that we were getting head voice decorations, like the distant falsetto-like nature on the closing sections of Plastic Off the Sofa. We were seeing Beyonce's head voice become more a part of the main melodies of songs, just like Cuffit's Roll Up Tonight, tonight. or Alien Superstar's chorus, just like we talked about, or the close of Virgo's Groove. And even in her approach of her chest voice, Beyonce chose a lighter registration that easily transitions into her head voice, like the tone of All Up In Your Mind. Or the pre-chorus of America has a problem. No, that booty gonna do what it want to. Now it's not that Beyonce didn't belt at all. She belted less and chose to use the lower songwriting tessituras and head voice registration to show a brand new side of her voice. 
Now, like most singers, Beyonce's head voice has some special strengths that she pulls on to wield this new sound. The lighter registration allows for more agility, like the bounce it run on move. It also extends into the highest parts of her range, like at the end of Virgo's groove. And this extension allows her higher backgrounds to have a more ethereal quality, like the accompanying counter melody on Heated. Or the bridge-like section of Thick. But most importantly, her head voice registration is something she can create with even more longevity. Now, changes in the voice are not only something that Beyonce has had to navigate. In fact, it was very interesting for me to hear Victoria Monet and Kelly Rowland speak about the changes in their voices since having children as well. My voice has changed since having Hazel, so it's like... Did it drop an octave? It dropped. I know. How can we get it back up? Girl, I wish when love takes over it was as high <laughs> live as it is on that record. Yo. But it was like, drop that down. Yes. We'll to the basement. <laughs> yes. Drop it down. Everything uh. changes. So this is not a new concept for for female singers who sustain their careers as they mature and as they have children. But for some reason, the internet seems to be obsessed with keeping artists the same. There is a heavy flaw in the way that we consume female voices. We expect high and hard singing every era of their music careers, no matter what phase of life they're in. We drink them dry, demanding new music that reminds us of the old and reject their changes. But Renaissance is one of the many invitations for us to see singing through the lens of the one thing that distinguishes it from other forms of music making. Singing is inherently human, and a human sound is an ever-evolving experience. It reflects what a human goes through from age to age and circumstance to circumstance. Change is normal, and change is beautiful. But what separates the singers that continue to last through change and the singers that don't is strategy that breeds longevity. And longevity was extremely important when it came to the Renaissance tour, where Beyonce would be taking all of the studio work into a live setting. But if Beyonce did a good job of planning, there wouldn't be a need for her to adjust her music on tour too much, like she has before, because the music would fit her like a glove. And that's exactly what happened on tour. Not only was every Renaissance song performed in the same key, it even followed the same sequence of the album. But when she did arrive at songs that were from earlier in her career, which was near the beginning of the Renaissance tour set list, it was very cool to see how she navigated that. And that's what we did when we studied Beyonce singing Dangerously in Love at the Renaissance tour. So check out that video and I'll see you next time. I'm O'Neill Gerald and this is the place where we help you to reclaim your voice.